Hey Optimancers, Chris here. Today we are going to be talking about Blade Singers. Now in this video I'm going to be talking about mechanics and tactics and optimal decisions you can make. In my next video I will be presenting a build. So if you're looking for a Blade Singer build, this isn't the video. This video I'm going to be talking mechanics. And the reason I need to do this for Blade Singer is, I mean in particular for Blade Singers, I just can't agree with most of what I read or see online when it comes to so-called optimization tips for blade singers. Now the purpose of this video isn't to tell you what way to play a blade singer that's the most fun because what's the most fun for you and what's the most fun for me might be different things and whatever's the most fun for you that's what you should do. Uh, the purpose of this video is I'm going to tell you the way to play a blade singer that I think is the most effective, the most mechanically powerful. So that's the purpose of this video. And again, if this isn't the way you want to play a blade singer, that's up to you. But it's still useful information, I think, for you to have. The videos of this channel are supported by patrons. Thank you to all the patrons of this channel. But today I want to specifically thank some of my top level patrons. Robbie's, Rohit. RVSP66, Ryan Squire, Sajin Abraham, Sam S, Scott Ballantyne, Scott Dunnington, Scott Shields, Sig, Stephen Edmondson, Stephen Saul, Stephen Yates, Steve Bouvel, TUM, Tazel, Thomas Barrero, Tom Tom, Tristan Bello, Vu, Wesley Terpstra, Wick, Zachary Shapiro, and Zandar the Mighty. Thank you all so much for your support. If you'd like to check out my Patreon, there is a link in the video description. Okay, so let's go over the basic features first. So when we become a blade singer at level two, we begin with two features. The first is training in war and song. You gain proficiency with light armor and you gain proficiency with one type of one-handed melee weapon of your choice. You also gain proficiency in the performance skill if you don't already have it. Second, we get blade song. This is obviously the iconic feature of this subclass. You can evoke an elven magic called Blade Song, provided that you aren't wearing medium armor or heavy armor or using a shield. It graces you with supernatural speed, agility, and focus. You can use a bonus action to start the Blade Song, which lasts for one minute. It ends early if you're incapacitated, if you don medium or heavy armor or a shield, or if you use two hands to make an attack with a weapon. You can also dismiss the Blade Song at any time. While your blade song is active, you gain the following benefits. You gain a bonus to armor class equal to your intelligence modifier. Your walking speed increases by 10 feet. You have advantage on dexterity acrobatics checks. And you gain a bonus to any constitution saving throw you make to maintain your concentration on a spell. This bonus equals your intelligence modifier. You can use this feature a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus. And you regain all expended uses of it when you finish a long rest. So a lot to unpack there, and we will. Then, at 6th level, Extra Attack. This is not like Extra Attack from any other class or subclass. You can attack twice instead of once whenever you take the attack action on your turn. Moreover, you can cast one of your cantrips in place of one of those attacks. Then, at 10th level, we get Song of Defense. You can direct your magic to absorb damage while your Blade Song is active. When you take damage, you can use your reaction to expand one spell slot and reduce that damage to you by an amount equal to five times the spell slot's level. And then our capstone, I guess, the Song of Victory. This is 14th level. You can add your intelligence modifier to the damage of your melee weapon attacks while your blade song is active. Now, rather than go through these one at a time and just give my opinions on them, Instead, I want to go over some general principles that these features spell out for us in regards to blade singers. First, intelligence is as or more important for blade singers than other wizard subclasses. It increases spell attack rolls and spell DCs, of course, like it does for all wizards. But with blade singers, intelligence is also adding to our armor class as well as our concentration saving throws while our blade song is active. In addition, at high levels, it also adds to our weapon attack damage 
though I don't think this is as big a deal as a lot of people make it out to be. Uh, and we'll be going over using weapons at higher levels later in this video. But what we can get from this is we want our intelligence as high as possible, as early as possible, because we're getting Bladesong at level 2. So we want to get that intelligence high quickly, even more than we do with other wizard subclasses. And with other wizard subclasses, what we need to remember is that uh, we don't have the boost to concentration saving throws normally. Uh, we also don't have the boost to armor class. So they need to consider what they're going to do to get their armor class in line. They need to consider what they're going to do to get their concentration saving throws in line or whether they want to increase their intelligence. Uh, but with Bladesong, all three of these decisions are the same decision. If you increase your intelligence, you're getting all the regular benefits, plus you're increasing armor class, plus you're improving concentration saving throws. So it makes that decision much easier. Number two, this is really important, uh, and it should be really obvious, and I'm sure it'll be obvious when I say it, but I think in a lot of people's heads, this isn't clear. Bladesingers are full wizards. So this is not like a multi-class arcane melee character. If we don't multi-class our Bladesinger, we are full classed in the most powerful class in the game. And we don't give up anything about being a wizard by choosing Bladesinger. So we just need to keep that in mind. We have chosen the most powerful class in the game. And why is the wizard the most powerful class in the game? Not because of how they stab stuff. They're the most powerful class in the game because spells are very powerful, wizards get the best spells, and they are flexible in their spellcasting. Uh, so all about spellcasting and the power of wizard spells, Bladesingers get full access. Number three, and this one will be a surprise to many, but I think it'll make sense when you think about it. There is an argument, and I think a reasonable argument, that Bladesingers are the best spellcasters of any wizard subclass. Uh, and that might seem counterintuitive, since it's a subclass that's based around using weapons, not casting spells. But the thing is, is because we can increase our armor class and our concentration saving throws uh, just straight through wizard, well, other subclasses of wizard end up needing to multi-class. So it's really common uh, that other subclasses will, for example, take a level of Artificer. And now you can take a level of Artificer and you can maintain your spell slot progression, but you don't maintain your spell progression. So in terms of your spell levels that you can access. But Bladesingers can go straight classed, still deal with their armor class just fine, and they don't delay their spellcasting progression. Basically, it comes down to this. If you want to make an optimal wizard and you are any subclass other than Bladesinger, you need to find a way to get some armor proficiency on there, and that's either going to require some multi-classing, which slows down spellcasting progression, or it's going to require feats, which slows down your increases to intelligence. But with Bladesingers, they have exactly the armor proficiencies they want. They have no desire to have any additional armor proficiencies, and their armor class is just fine without them. So they just don't need it. That means they can focus on intelligence, and that makes them better at spellcasting. Also, other wizards need to worry about maintaining concentration more than Bladesingers do. So they're worrying about things like getting uh, proficiency on constitution saving throws, for example. Uh, well, a Bladesinger definitely wants Warcaster. Other than that, they probably are fine with their concentration saves while they're blade singing because they will have both advantage plus add their intelligence bonus, which is probably higher than their proficiency bonus at most levels. Now, I don't want to overstate here because other wizard subclasses are getting different features, and a lot of those features are really powerful and aid spellcasting. Uh, so if you were to ask me what the most powerful spellcaster is of any wizard subclass, I don't know that I would say Bladesinger. I probably wouldn't. Uh, but I just want to say there are arguments for them being the best spellcasters amongst wizards that I think are reasonable. I don't think they're enough to make them the best, but they are definitely better than they're sometimes considered. Number four. This one is a big one. Bladesingers do not get the ability to use intelligence in place of their strength or dexterity to attack with weapons. This is important. We have three options to deal with this. First, we could multi-class into Artificer and take Battlesmith at level 3 
and that would allow us to use intelligence to attack with magical weapons. However, we need to look at the cost of that. Let's say we had Blazinger for 6 levels to get extra attack, and then we multiclass into Artificer for 3 levels. Here's what we would sacrifice for doing that. First, we lose a level of spell slot progression, so we're looking at 4th level slots instead of 5th level slots maximum. Then, we lose out on 2 levels of actual spells, so we could have had 5th level spells and we're still maxed out with 3rd level spells. So we're giving up Wall of Force, Animate Objects, Polymorph, Ever's Black Tentacles, and the list goes on. Finally, we've given up an ability score increase. So not only are we casting lower level spells with lower level slots, but we're also worse at casting them. This is just way too much. So that brings us to our second option, and that is to prioritize dexterity over intelligence. This one is a little bit more attractive to me than going with Artificer. We're eventually talking a minus two spell save DC and minus two to hit with our spell attacks. And our concentration saves are gonna be at minus two as well while blade singing. And speaking of blade singing, our armor class isn't even higher for these sacrifices when we're using blade song. But the benefits here aren't bad, honestly. Initiative is increased, that's nice. Armor class when we're not blade singing, and remember, we are not blade singing all the time, so that is good. And we get a bonus to hit and damage when using dexterity for weapon attacks, which we will be doing. This one is somewhat tempting because the sacrifices we make aren't nearly as severe as they are with multi-classing artificer, but minus 2 DC on spells is still really big. The third option is just not to focus on using weapons over spells. And that's what it comes down to. As we increase in levels, our desire to use weapons over spells is going to decrease. So we should start with the best dexterity we can, but we should focus on our intelligence. And by the time that makes a difference, we focus on the ability score we're going to be using more often. And that brings us to an often overlooked principle of the Blade Singer. At level six, using a melee weapon and a cantrip like Booming Blade feels really good. And you know what? It works pretty well. Every time you level up past level 6 though, the spells you can cast become more plentiful and more powerful at an exponential rate, and your weapon attacks are improving marginally. We're getting diminishing returns on weapon attacks and exponential growth in spell power. Now there are spells that improve weapon attacks or simulate weapons but they are delivering diminishing results. They really are. Here's the math. So the take I hear all the time is Bladesingers should use their concentration and spell slots on Shadowblade, then use two weapon fighting with a short sword. Then what you do is you can attack once with a Shadowblade, then you attack a second time with a short sword and add Booming Blade, and then use two weapon fighting for a bonus action attack with Shadowblade. And the reason why this is sounding complicated is because in Tasha's, they changed Booming Blade and Green Flame Blade so that they need to be used with a weapon that has value. Uh, officially speaking, spell effects don't have value, so then you wouldn't be able to use your Shadow Blade with the Booming Blade or Green Flame Blade. So this is kind of the workaround for that. Uh, now, if you're a DM, I recommend not worrying about it. If somebody wants a Booming Blade with their Shadow Blade, just let them do that, and then they can use their two-weapon fighting with their short sword or whatever. Uh, but we're going by rules as written here, so that is the procedure to make this combination work. Now we can and probably should have our Blade Singer start with a 16 dexterity. That means a plus three bonus to hit and to damage. And let's consider level six. So if we want, we could use a second level slot on Shadow Blade, and that would be 2d8 base damage. Now, if you want to know how I calculate damage, I do link a video in the video description that goes over exactly how I calculate damage, uh, and I'm using that here. So, based on that method, our chance to hit is 55%. We're doing a d6 from the short sword, 48 because we're attacking twice with our shadow blade attacks, we're getting a d8 from booming blade, and you know what, let's say 50% chance to trigger our secondary damage, so that's 2d8 divided by 2, or 
basically a D8, from secondary booming blade damage. Then we're getting six from our dexterity because we're not adding it to our bonus action attack because we don't have the two weapon fighting combat style. That gives us a total of 36.5 times 55% or about 20 points of damage. About 22 points when we consider the chance to score criticals. Baseline damage at this point is 16 and a half, so we are over baseline. Damage is okay, it's not stellar, not like we're competing with Shepherd Druids or even crossbow expert sharpshooting fighters at this level or anything, but we are doing okay damage. But the wisdom I hear is that we shouldn't be using our second level slot, we should be using our third level slot to cast Shadowblade. So let's say we're upcasting the third level. So the first thing I need to mention is this could have been a hypnotic pattern or a fly spell, but we're going to use it to upcast Shadowblade instead. Let's see what that gives us. So now our base damage is 68 for two Shadowblade attacks. So it becomes 45.5 times 0.55, or 27 damage after critical hits are considered. Now 27 damage is pretty good damage for the level. Like I said, baseline is 16 and a half. So yeah, 27 is strong damage. Now the thing I'll mention though, is it's five higher than if we had spent a second level slot. So you need to consider that you're basically giving up your ability to cast your most powerful spells uh, so that you can do five additional points of damage per round. Uh, so, I mean, in my opinion, that's not worth it. But uh, you can make your own decisions, but that is the cost and the benefit of doing a third level slot instead of a second level slot. And it's probably comparable with a fighter that focuses on archery. But then again, that fighter is not concentrating, not limited to three fights per long rest, and more importantly, we're not really getting 27 damage around. Because you know what? On round one, we're using a bonus action to cast a spell, so we're not using two weapon fighting, so our damage is actually about 20 on round one. But you know what? What if we're in dim light or darkness? Because then we get advantage on the shadow blade attacks. Not our Booming Blade attack, mind you. Our Booming Blade attack is done with a short sword that does not get advantage because you're in Dim Light or Darkness. Only your Shadow Blade attacks do. So we increase the chance to hit on those two Shadow Blade attacks by 35%. So now our damage goes to 37. And you know what? 37 damage per round is strong damage at level 6. Except there's another problem. We're not Blade Singing, and our concentration is super vulnerable. And if we lose concentration, now we're sitting at square one minus a third level slot. So really it's not a two round setup, it's a three round setup. Round one, it's blade song and short sword attacks, no two weapon fighting. Then round two, it's shadow blade and no two weapon fighting. Then round three, now we're delivering good damage. If we can prepare beforehand, so we have two rounds of pre-battle preparation, we're level six, we're in dim light or darkness, we expend our third level spell slot, we hold concentration for the fight, then we can deliver 37 damage average per round, and that's good damage. So it can happen, but let's just not pretend this is the normal. This isn't the normal, this requires an exceptional situation. In the standard combat, where you're not getting a chance to activate your blade song or cast your bonus action shadow blade before the combat begins, then what happens is on round one, we're making short sword attacks. Uh, no two weapon fighting. We can use uh, booming blade though. Then on round two, we can add in a shadow blade attack. So we're doing one booming blade attack with a short sword, and then one uh, shadow blade attack. Uh, and then round three, we're doing our full routine. Uh, so we kind of get this building effect where on round one, we're not actually being all that effective. Then round two, a little bit more. And then round three, we're doing pretty good damage. But you know what? It's a nice option to have. If I'm a six level blade singer, casting shadow blade, going into melee, that's something I'm going to do once in a while. But that is six level. What happens at 11th level? At this point, a fighter built for archery is doing in the range of about 40 points of damage per round. Now, we could upcast Shadow Blade to 5th or 6th level. That's 48. And our Booming Blade damage has scaled. So, if we're increasing intelligence over dexterity, which we probably should do, our chance to hit now is about 50%. But if we get advantage through Shadow Blade, 
then we have 75% in dim light or darkness. So, round one. We use our blade song, and we attack twice with our short sword, one of which is a booming blade. That's 2d6 short sword damage, 6 dexterity to damage, 2d8 booming blade damage, 3d8 divided by 2, which is our secondary booming blade damage, equals 28.75 times 50%, that's 14.38, the baseline is 27.15. Uh, Fighter with Archery is doing 40 per round. So our damage on round one is terrible. So what that means is on round one, we probably shouldn't be going into melee with our short sword and doing an attack and a booming blade attack. But we have really limited our options. Uh, we can't do anything that's going to require a bonus action, and we can't do anything that's going to require a concentration. And that latter part is the big problem. Because, of course, the most effective spells we have use concentration, but we're going to need our concentration for the Shadow Blade, so we can't do that. So, you know, we're lobbing a fireball, something like that. Because on round two, we cast Shadow Blade, and we're using a high-level slot. I, I want to just mention, this could have been a Wall of Force. But instead, we're doing a Shadow Blade. We attack once with a Shadow Blade, again with a Short Sword with Booming Blade, but because we've used our bonus action to cast Shadow Blade, there will be no two-weapon fighting on this turn. So, for our damage calculations, because one's with advantage, one's without, we'll calculate our short sword damage and our Shadow Blade damage separately. So first, we'll do our short sword damage. This is a d6 for the short sword, 3 from our dexterity, 2d8 from booming blade, 3d8 divided by 2 for secondary booming blade damage, equals 22.25 times 50%, or 11.13 from our booming blade attack. Then we have our shadow blade. It's doing 48 plus 3 dexterity. That's 21. And we're going to have advantage, so we're multiplying it by 75%, or 15.75. So the right move here is actually not to attack with the short sword at all, and just give up booming blade, attack with the shadow blade twice. Then we can get, you know, a little over 30 points of damage. But on round three, we can now use two weapon fighting for Shadow Blade. So we need to add that bonus action attack damage, which is 48. There's no dexterity bonus, so it's 18 times 75%, or 13 and a half damage. Add that to 26.88, and we end up with 40.38. Adjusting for criticals, uh, we basically add about four points of damage on average. Now, here's the bad news. This is roughly equivalent to what the fighter's been doing since round one, and has been doing all damn day. This requires three rounds of setup, and our high-level spell slots, and our concentration, and the fighter is outperforming us. And I've even assumed the most favorable conditions. We've got the dim light or darkness giving us advantage with our shadow blade attacks, and I'm assuming that the fighter does not have advantage, and that's still where we end up. Now, if the wizard is the most powerful class in the game, then why are we being humbled by the fighter? Well, we shouldn't be, but if we reduce ourselves from being a full casting wizard to using spells to try to simulate being a fighter, we don't measure up. Speaking of casting spells to simulate being a fighter, it's time to talk about Tensor's Transformation. Because you talk about a spell that turns your wizard into a fighter, Tensor's Transformation is kind of the first one that comes to mind. Now, the first time I read this spell, I was convinced it was a bad spell. And apparently, that was not the common opinion at the time. And it is still not the common opinion. But, you know what? Given years of use, I am absolutely convinced that the common opinion is wrong. I'm convinced from the math, and I'm convinced from experience. I'm going to share both with you. And if afterwards, you're still convinced that Tensor's Transformation isn't a terrible spell... I would love to hear why in the comments, because I don't think I'm missing anything here. We need to be 11th level to cast a spell, no multi-classing. Fighters, as I said, are doing 40 plus damage per round all day at this level. We cast Tensors, using our lone 6th level spell slot, our most powerful resource. It uses our concentration, which is fine, I guess. I mean, we can't cast spells anyways once we cast this spell, so we don't need our concentration for anything else. Only barbarians involved in raging are also not allowed to cast spells, and let's face it, this is a way bigger sacrifice for a wizard than it is for a barbarian. 
Now, let's assume we're casting outside of combat. Otherwise, it's an entire turn of combat. But you know what? We have a 10 minute duration here, so I think it's totally reasonable to assume you're going to be able to set this up outside of combat. We get 50 temporary hit points, and that's nice, but how nice is it? Well, even an 11 CR creature, and we know that fighting your own level and challenge rating in higher level play is like setting your video game to easy mode. But even that monster is supposed to deliver around 70 points of damage per round on hits. Now, we've removed our ability to cast shield or absorb elements. Like, we did that on purpose. I mean, one combat, that 50 temporary hit points isn't going to cover that loss. Never mind that temporary hit points don't stack. So you're the character that isn't benefiting from the protector cannons or anything like that. So rather than this being an actual benefit, it's more like a band-aid for not being able to cast your defensive spells. Not a bad band-aid, but it really isn't a boost. But let's look at our offensive boosts, because here we do see things that are a little more substantial. You have advantage on all attack rolls with simple or martial weapons. And when we hit, we deal an additional 2d12 force damage. So the best way to handle this, I think, is two short swords. Two weapon fighting is going to be essential to maximize our number of attacks, and we want to get that 2d12 as often as we can. Now, this isn't a joke. I hear online all the time that what the wizard should do is pick up a longbow and use a longbow uh, so if you want to use a longbow in tensor's transformation just go ahead and take the damage of a full attack off my calculations that's what it does to you it's really really bad uh, but i do i hear people say all the time oh just pick up a longbow uh, no 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 you're you will be a bad archer uh, and you'll be a bad archer and nothing else so we're going to use short sword, we will be attacking three times around when we use two weapon fighting, and we'll be delivering an additional 2d12 damage when we hit, and our attacks will be made with advantage. How good this is, we'll be going over that. The next thing this spell does is it gives us proficiency in any kind of armor. So we're already proficient in light armor, and if we put on armor we're not proficient with, we can't cast spells, including this spell. If we aren't wearing those armors, well, it takes 10 minutes to don heavy armor. So by the time we get heavy armor on, the spell is over. Now, if it's medium armor, it's five minutes to get on. But when the spell ends, now we're wearing armor we're not proficient with. And it's going to take 10 rounds to remove it. And you desperately need to remove it. You do not want to be a wizard wearing armor you're not proficient in. If we're in the middle of combat and someone, say, cast Dispel Magic on us, we're dead. Wait, I guess we could Counterspell. Oh yeah, no, we purposely removed our ability to cast Counterspell. Now, we can't get on Heavy Armor, so that's worthless. But let's say we do Medium Armor, so that's Half Plate and Shield, and we'll just take our chances that we won't lose the spell in combat. So, how much does that give us? Well, our Armor Class is 15 from Half Plate, 17 after dexterity, and two more from a shield. So we have an armor class of 19. If we don't put on armor, our armor class is 10, plus 3 from dexterity, plus 3 from mage armor, and plus 4 from bladesong. So 20. So not only do we give up two weapon fighting, and take the chance of losing our spell, and being stuck in armor we're not proficient with, but this actually lowers our armor class. This is worthless at best. I mean, it's really a trap. A trap for players that don't know this is so bad. Next, we have proficiency in all martial weapons. Again, this is worthless. At least it's not a trap. We're already proficient in the weapon we want to use. Then we get proficiency in strength and constitution saving throws. This one's pretty good. Strength isn't coming up much, but constitution plus blade song means our concentration is pretty solid. But you know what? Let's say for a moment that I was playing a high-level wizard and my DM offered me proficiency in strength and constitution saving throws in exchange for my ability to cast defensive spells like counterspell or shield or absorb elements that can prevent me from making those saving throws in the first place or prevent a ton of damage, I would laugh. I mean, 
Come on. Next, we can attack twice instead of once when we take the attack action on our turn. Not only is this worthless, this is a downgrade. We could already attack twice, but now we can't cast a cantrip in place of one of those attacks. So we've just lost Booming Blade. So in total, the defensive boosts here are just worse than if we could just cast defensive spells. So our defense actually got a bit worse. There are some things that help. We get a proficiency in a couple saving throws and the temporary hit points. So those do help make up that difference. But I'd say overall, we're a little bit worse for defense. As for our offense, we do get some damage boost and advantage. So let's do the math and see how effective that is. Okay, so what happens on round one? Well, we want a blade song. So we make two attacks with advantage with our short sword. 2d6 is the short sword damage, 6 for dexterity, 4d12 for the tensor's force damage, that equals 39 times 75% because we have advantage on our attacks. That is a total of 29.25 damage. Add a couple points for criticals. And remember, the fighter does over 40 damage per round. So we're bad at delivering damage. And unlike the first round of the Shadow Blade setup, we can't do anything else because we gave up our ability to cast spells. So in round one of the combat, we are actually bad at everything. We cast a spell that made us bad at everything in round one of a combat. And if you listen to the advice to pick up a longbow, this is the entire duration of the spell. You do like a point more because longbow does a tiny bit more damage than a short sword. But this is basically all you get for the entire spell. Awful. But you know what? On round two, we can use two weapon fighting. So let's see how much that adds. So now we have 3d6 short sword damage, 6 from dexterity, we're still not getting any additional dexterity with a bonus action attack. And then we have 6d12 tensor's force damage, and that's 54.5 times 75%, that's 40.88, add a couple more points for critical hits. So now we can do similar damage to the fighter, except on average we're doing less because we did less on round 1. This is about the same damage that we did by upcasting Shadow Blade by the way. Except we're a high level wizard and we deliberately shut off our ability to cast spells. With Shadow Blade, at least we're still a wizard. We still have our sixth level spell slot because we can upcast with our fifth. Not that I'm recommending that either. In fact, I specifically said I don't think it's good. But if that's not a good option, then this is crap. So we're not improving our defense overall. Our offense could be better improved using a lower level slot and a lower level spell, but we're not done screwing ourselves over yet. Once the spell is done, now we make a constitution saving throw or we gain a level of exhaustion. Exhaustion is terrible, by the way. The only way to get rid of it is to take a long rest or a greater restoration spell. Oh, and the constitution proficiency that this spell gave you is gone before you make the save. So we cast this, our defense probably goes down, our offense does not become impressive, barely matching what we could do with cheaper options that don't restrict our spellcasting. We turn off our spellcasting, and then we get a final kick in the nuts at the end as a punishment for our bad decision making. So high level wizards are generally recognized as the most powerful option at these levels. But we're going to cast a spell to turn that off and actually be worse than a class we already knew was worse than the wizard and we're expending our highest level spell in order to do this. And we're doing this by choice. We're giving up all this stuff and we're choosing to do it. it. I don't get it. I mean, if this was a free feature, I don't know that I would use it. And the people who recognize high level wizards are more powerful than high level fighters are often the ones who also think this spell is good. And I just have to wonder why? They're literally of the belief that the wizard is the most powerful at this level, then recommend a spell that turns that off and doesn't even replace it with something even equivalent, never mind better. Here is what I think it is. I suspect that a lot of players are playing with people who don't optimize, right? So you're playing with a fighter and they're using a long sword and a shield and they're going in and they're doing D8 plus maybe seven damage per hit. 
and they're doing lousy damage. So we go in with this, and then we're showing them what fighter damage could be, and that looks really good in comparison. That's kind of what I'm thinking is happening, because if you're playing with players that optimize characters, and they're playing fighters, or rangers, or paladins, or any class that does decent damage with weapons, then we're simply casting this, and we're not quite matching them. So why do I say Tensor's Transformation is bad? Well, I say it's bad because we cast it, and the kind of the theme of it is that it's supposed to turn us into this super fighter, but it doesn't. It turns us about as good as a well-built fighter, at delivering damage, that is, but actually even a bit worse. And all we can do is deliver damage. Even fighters have other decent options. And we gave up being a wizard, and potentially exhaustion at the end. And it's a high-level spell slot, 6th level. I mean, there's no level where 6th level spells are a small investment. So yeah, when I say Tensor's Transformation is bad, that's why. I understand this isn't the popular opinion, but I look at the math, and it's just so clearly bad. But when I say, here's the math, and this is why it's bad, then I get told, well, if I spend my time evaluating things instead of actually playing the game, and if I actually played more, I would understand why this is better, because I'm making all my decisions from these calculations rather than actually playing the game. And you know what? That's frustrating to hear. Because, you know what? I do evaluate things through math. That's true. I mean, that's part of what I do on this channel. But I play D&D a lot. I would expect I play D&D well more than most of you would ever guess. As I record this, it's January. I play in three weekly groups. Sundays, Mondays, and Fridays. Yeah, three weekly groups. But I don't stop there. I also play with my top-level patrons on top of that. That's nine games this month. I played two more times with Colby, Monty, and Kelly in a channel collaboration. You can check out those videos on my channel. That's 25 times of playing D&D in January. About half the time as a player, about half as a DM. So when I say I play D&D a lot, I mean I play D&D a lot. So when I say something is good or bad, as long as it's not brand spanking new, I can say that opinion involves a ton of experience watching it in real play, in addition to any mathematical analysis I do. And you know what? Experience does change my opinions on things. I've done videos talking about things I have changed my opinions on because of experience. Tensor's transformation isn't one of those, because it is consistently bad in my experience, as well as bad in the mathematical calculations, and by the way, without six level spell, we could have cast mass suggestion. Mass suggestion. So when I say Tensor's Transformation is a terrible spell for wizards, I don't mean for wizards except for blade singers. I mean for wizards. Now, once again, I'm going to remind you that this channel is about giving optimization advice, um, and I'll share things that I find are fun in my personal experience, but I'm not telling you what's fun in your experience. Of course, I can't do that. Uh, so, you know what, if Tensor's Transformation is fun for you, then go for it. But here is the optimal way to play Bladesinger, in my opinion. And that is, sure, at level 6, go ahead, wade into melee, use the, your Shadow Blade, as long as you got Dim Light or Darkness. Uh, and then you can do, you know, decent damage, and you can kind of mix that up with spell casting, and that's kind of fun, and kind of what a Bladesinger is all about. But there comes a point, and this is just the mechanics of the game, it's... Not really something that I'm happy about, but it's the mechanics of the game that when it comes to delivering damage with weapons, blade singers are going to give us diminishing results as we level up. And it doesn't matter that we have higher level spells or spell slots that we can use to enhance those things, because those things are also giving us diminishing results compared to the other spells we can cast. So if I'm going to give you the advice that I think is optimal for a blade singer, it is, as we get into these higher levels, we need to consider that stabbing stuff just has to be less and less of what we do. Now, there is lots of advice online for how you can make stabbing stuff 
better when you get to higher levels with the blade singer and what it usually comes down to is multi-classing right you you grab a couple levels of fighter and now you can action surge these kinds of things except the issue is that if we're going to multi-class our blade singer we're pissing away the stuff that's going to make us ultra powerful especially once we get to 11th level i mean now we're into getting into our high level spells ninth level spells are on the horizon and we're going to multi-class and I can, in good conscience, say that's an optimal way to go. So instead, what I'm going to recommend is that we adjust our tactics. We play a blade singer, yeah, we stab stuff, uh, and we cast spells. But as we level up, the power of those spells is increasing exponentially. Well, the power of stabbing stuff is reducing. It's giving us diminishing returns. So what we need to do is, as the levels increase and the power of those spells increase, we're going to adjust our tactics to make best use of the features that are available to us. So playing a blade singer at level six and playing a blade singer at level 11, playing a blade singer at level 17, these are all very different experiences if we want to play optimally. One of the most powerful things I ever heard regarding the blade singer was that a blade singer should be thought of as any other kind of wizard, except that instead of attack cantrips, we're stabbing stuff. But stabbing stuff is our option when other wizards would be lobbing firebolts. A 17th level war mage isn't bending over backwards to make the firebolt their primary action. It's what they do to fill in some gaps in a long adventuring day. Same thing with a blade singer and stabbing stuff. Hypnotic pattern, polymorph, wall of force, mass suggestion, force cage, maze. These are the most powerful things that any wizard can do. And choosing blade singer as your wizard subclass doesn't change that. That's how I think you got to look at a blade singer if you want to make it the most optimal way. So we've talked about prioritizing intelligence, but not ignoring weapon use. So what kind of weapon should we use? Well, my recommendation, I think I mentioned already, is a short sword, just for the versatility of being able to use it with two weapon fighting. And I know you won't always be using two weapon fighting, but if you're not using two weapon fighting, yeah, you could use a rapier. You know how much more damage a rapier does than a short sword? One point. One point. It's almost nothing. And just having that option of two weapon fighting is probably worth that one point. Now, you could choose to ignore melee, right? You could choose to ignore melee. You would need to find a way to get proficiency in the hand crossbow. Now, you can't get hand crossbow as your weapon proficiency through Bladesinger. It's only in proficiency in a melee weapon. But there are other ways you can get that proficiency. So why would you want to do the hand crossbow? Well, a hand crossbow can be used alongside blade song since it's not a two-handed weapon. But I'm not recommending this, and here's why. Uh, first, you don't have a booming blade equivalent at range, so you're either making two crossbow attacks or one crossbow attack and one attack cantrip, and this is going to be a damage reduction unless you prioritize your crossbow enhancing feats. And if you do, then you need two of them sharpshooter and crossbow expert in which case you're not increasing your intelligence or protecting your concentration you're going to be doing less damage than a fighter but you've crippled your spell casting just not worth it in my opinion so i recommend the short sword but you should absolutely have a light crossbow as well and here's why sometimes you just need to attack at range wizards get this proficiency for free and the loading property of crossbows limits you to attacking once with it on your turn that isn't a problem and never becomes a problem because we can use a cantrip in place of our second attack. So we don't need crossbow expert to deal with the loading property. Now this is going to be secondary uh, because our short sword is going to be primary and we can use our short swords with blade song. Like crossbows we can't use with blade song because they're two handed. So when we use our crossbow at range this is when we're not using blade song. But the thing is, is we're probably not using blade song in every fight. We can only use it proficiency bonus per long rest. Uh, so when we first get it, that's like twice per day, right? Uh, and assuming you're doing more than two combats, then you're not using blade song in every fight. So when you're not using blade song in a fight and you want to attack at range, like crossbow plus an attack cantrip works just fine. When it comes to ability scores, this is what I recommend. At level one, we're going to equally prioritize our dexterity and our intelligence. Uh, as we level up, we will focus on intelligence, but at level one, basically equivalent for each of them, I like to have a 16 minimum 
for both my dexterity and my intelligence scores. Then constitution is secondary. Now if we can get a 16 to our constitution as well, great. And there are ways to do that, but depending on our racial selection, that may not be possible. In which case, we're going to have to live with a 14. 14 is still okay. When it comes to wisdom or our charisma or our strength, we essentially have to dump those. Now, I don't recommend multi-classing blade singers in the first place, but if you do want to multi-class your blade singer, I definitely don't recommend multi-classing into anything that's going to require a minimum strength score, wisdom score, or charisma score, because getting those even to a 13 is crippling to our primary ability scores. So uh, it just doesn't really work unless you have some other method of ability score generation that's a lot more generous than a point buy. The final thing I'm going to cover in this video is what race we want to choose for our blade singer. And blade singers are actually pretty cool here in that there are a lot of different choices that I think are roughly equivalent. I normally find that custom lineage is the best and then variant human the second best and then everything else isn't as good. Uh, now Herengon's kind of a unique case because of course it's more recent and I'll find that the higher level you go the better Herengon gets in comparison to variant human and custom lineage. So arguably Herengon also is a pretty common choice but uh, there are a couple things here. So with custom lineage the problem is that we're getting a plus two to one ability score uh, and we're not getting plus two or a plus one to another ability score. So that means in order to get that intelligence and dexterity to those 16 minimums, assuming a point by, then our feet has to boost the other one. So if we started with say a 17 intelligence and 15 dexterity, we have to choose a feat that's gonna increase our dexterity or vice versa. Uh, so th that's still good. I mean, Fae Touched is a great feat. So we could have dexterity as our plus two bonus and then a plus one bonus to intelligence with Fae Touched and then we get Misty Step and we get another first level spell. We can cast them for free. So, you know, custom lineage is still good. Very human, same thing. I mean, you can get the 16 uh, to your intelligence and dexterity actually before your feet. Then you could actually start with Warcaster. That's a really nice feat to start with as well. Though we still might want to consider Fae Touched as our starting feat. And then maybe pick up Warcaster at level 4. Uh, but there's a few other races that I think do really well here. Herengon really does great on a Blade Singer. Uh, because, of course, the initiative bonus is good and it scales with our level so it gets better and better. As I said, Herengons tend to do better at higher levels in comparison to Custom Lineage and Variant Human. Maybe not quite as good at low levels. Uh, the other thing is we have that Rabbit Hop that is going to allow us to... We could go into melee, uh, and if we're not going to do two-weapon fighting, then we could use our bonus action, and we can get out of melee without provoking opportunity attacks. Uh, and that's done a limited number of times per day, but it is useful in combination with Blade Singer because we probably don't want to just hang out in melee. So I do think Heron Gone's really good. The next one I want to mention is the Turtle. The Turtle has natural defense that gives them basically an armor class of 17. Now, that 17 armor class can be enhanced with Blade Song as well as the Shield Spell. So Tortle actually probably gives us the best armor class we can get with a Blade Singer. Now it puts us a feet behind uh, Custom Lineage or Variant Human, uh, but it is still really good to have a good armor class. The next one I would want to mention is the Goblin. The Goblin is also extremely good for a Blade Singer. The Goblin can disengage or hide as a bonus action. So the disengage allows them to do the same thing as the Heron Gone, but without limited uses, where they can go into melee, they can get out of melee without provoking opportunity attacks, and there's no limited uses. But again, you can't combine it with two-weapon fighting because that uses their bonus action. The other thing is, if we're going to cast like a big devastating spell, and that's largely what wizards do, including blade singers, then what we can do is we can cast a spell and then use our bonus action to hide. And when we talk about protecting concentration, and I've said this before, the best way to protect your concentration is to not take damage. And if you're hidden, that is going to largely prevent you taking damage. So you can cast your spell, hide, and that will really protect your concentration well. Like I said, I'm going to be doing a build. Obviously, i got to select one of these races. 
Um, but I just wanted to mention all these selections are optimal. And that's the basic stuff I wanted to talk about about Blade Singer before I present a build. Uh, based on the length of this video, you can imagine how long that video would be if I threw it all into one. So I hope you'll join me for my Blade Singer build, which will be my next video. Otherwise, until next time, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, everybody, and I'll talk to you soon. Mm -hmm.